All right, practice Indy. We have one of our beloved students that I had the privilege to get to know more this summer, but Katie Songson has been a member since we were in the garage, uh, right? I remember, I remember one of your first classes actually. Um, and you have just been such a light in our community. And when it popped into my head to have this conversation with you, I like had just like major heart butterflies. Um, so Katie Songson is an OG practice Indy member. She's an educator. And this week we are talking about Samavesha. So I'm going to share just a little bit about that definition. And then I want her to share more about how amazing she is. But um, really, I don't need to introduce how much of a bright light she is because you're going to hear it and see it if you're watching the YouTube version. So Samavesha, uh, as we are discussing it this week, is reintegration. And some definitions I have here, to immerse oneself into something one is already a part of, to unite with the whole that one was never separate from. Um, and then a third one, to come together as a community, to learn, collaborate, practice, and grow. So these are just some of the ways we can consider this concept of Samavesha. And specifically, I wanted to speak to you, Katie, because you are an educator. Um, it is, by the time we release this October, and I think you will have already gone into the like phase of reintegration in school. Um, so share first just about yourself and, uh, and then we'll dive into some of Asia and school. Sure. Um, right, so Shannon said, my name's Katie Songston and I am a seventh grade English language arts teacher at Franklin Community Middle School. So that's down in Franklin. Um, it is my third year teaching there, my fifth year teaching overall. My first two years teaching were at Broad Ripple Magnet High School, um, which is part of the Indianapolis Public Schools District, which if you remember a few years ago, was one of the IPS schools that got shut down um, after the district decided to consolidate their seven high schools into four. Um, so when I, when Broad Ripple closed, I could have stayed in IPS and gone to a different high school or gone somewhere else and I was actually coaching middle school age kids. I was a swimmer and I swam in college and I was coaching swimming and I really liked that middle school age group and I had this window of time where I was leaving high school or I, I could be leaving high school and I was like you know I really like these middle school kids like maybe that's where my heart's meant to be and I don't know if it's just because I'm still an angsty teenager at heart or what but like I love middle school <laughs> age group. <laughs> um, they are really like the perfect fit. I always say they're old enough where you don't have to wipe their nose or take them to the bathroom, <laughs> but they're young enough where they still want to hug you and tell you about their day. And that's just, um, I think, perfect for me. I could still get really corny with like silly lessons and dress up on spirit days and they don't think I'm super lame like high school kids would. Um, but I'm definitely not, not prepared for the like nose wiping bathroom, like class of 30 kindergartners. There are people that are, and I have the utmost respect for them, but it is not my forte. I love middle school. That is where my heart is at. So um, yeah, I graduated in uh, 2016 from the University of Indianapolis, and I actually have, a, I double majored two bachelor's degrees in political science and communication with an emphasis in public relations. So I did not major in education which was a very short roundabout, um, I guess, in my life away from education. I wanted to be a teacher my entire life, literally from being like six and playing at school with my American Girl dolls like every day, <laughs> like that. I always wanted to be in education. And then I was like 18 and it was senior year of high school and that was also the 2012 election. And I was very inspired um, by the 2012 election. I was like, I'm gonna go into politics and I was gonna work on campaigns. So like PR and poli sci, I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. And then by junior year, I was TAing for a class in, at college um, at UND. And I was like, you know, I really like this teaching thing. So then I had to like kind of find this roundabout way to get back into teaching. So um, I taught at Broad Ripple Journalism and Mass Media. So taking my media background and then actually teaching it and then decided to go back for my master's in education. And so I did my master's in secondary education at Indiana University, uh, graduated in 2018, 17, I don't even remember one of those years. Um, and 2018, I guess it would have been. Yeah, I don't even remember. Um, it was like two years ago, I don't know. And uh, yeah, so finished up my master's degree actually in education, so I have, do have a degree in that. Um, and then, yeah, I've been, then got the job at Franklin and here I am. So 
Wow. I did not know all that. Yes. It was like a very short little, like my heart has been in education my entire life. So much of my family, my relatives, they are all in education. Um, my mom's a professor. My dad was a coach. My little brother's in school to be an educator. I'm an uncle and a grandfather. We're school principals. Like it was always part of my life, but that's why I think like rebellious 18 year old Katie was like, I'm going to go to something different like for two years. And then I came back and I was like, no, I really wanted to be a teacher. Four-year-old Katie was right. I really needed to be a teacher. I, I feel you. I, I hold nothing against my parents because I think they did exactly what I would do. But my parents, um, you know, I was, I was really gifted in the arts. And so my parents were like, you can't throw this away. Like so many people will go in through their lives and wonder what if. And so they, I wanted to go to school for being a teacher. My parents were like, you can't, like you can't throw this God given gift away. So I went to conservatory and oddly enough, I've landed in the seat of the teacher so many times, just not in a, in a formal setting. So I feel you and I'm so um, happy for your kids and our world that, especially with the political science background and especially right now, that you are their teachers. And I know for me, junior high was possibly more formative than high school just because like that set the, that set the course, right? Like I did a lot of my weird shit in high school, but it's because of like the roots that I put down in junior high or middle school. Um, So I'm super grateful that you are leading our youth. Um, So with that, would you share just kind of what, what have the, what has the last few months been like as an educator, um, you know, moving into e-learning and what has that whole experience been like for you with the coronavirus? Right. So right now we are on a hybrid model. Um, We have half of our kids Monday and Tuesday everybody's virtual on Wednesday so they can clean and sanitize everything. The other half the kids come back Thursday, Friday, and then they clean and re-sanitize over the weekend and we start it all over. Um, Originally though, that was not the plan. And so I had kind of an up and down this summer with originally it was like, yeah, we'll all go back to school. We'll just wear masks. And it's like, oh my gosh, we don't know what's going to happen. And that was like a really stressful like week and a half or it wasn't very long, but um, then, you know, they reevaluated and they came back and they said, okay, we're going to push back the start of school, come up with a safer plan. And so we did that. And I'm so proud to be part of a district that took that step because there are a lot of districts across the U.S. that um, either just said, nope, we'll just all go to e-learning. That's fine. And there's a lot of issues with that, especially with um, just equity, with income, racial equity, um, with you know, risk and exposure to the coronavirus, but also I I listened to a podcast called Partial Credit, um, and it's about education, and I saw one of the hosts at an education conference a couple years ago, but they threw out a term that stuck with me called tech woody, like equity, but with technology, Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a huge thing too, so there's problems with going back to all e-learning for those reasons. There's also issues of just throwing everybody back because I think we saw back in August, a lot of schools put everybody back and then they had a bunch of outbreaks. And we've seen that in higher education. So many colleges around the country have just had massive outbreaks and it you know, totally went the opposite direction than I think they wanted it to. So I feel like we went down a really good path. It was well thought out, down the middle, hybrid schedule. I only have about 10 to 15, I don't even know if I have 15, 10 to 13 or 14 kids in a class at one time, um, they can actually be six feet apart. And I have, I can honestly say I've not once felt unsafe at school, um, which is really good. So I'm really happy with where we're at, um, at least for right now. So um, yeah, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the upcoming weeks and months. I know that they are throwing out the idea of bringing everybody back. Um, But I also hear from the other side that, you know, as we get into colder months and we can't take kids outside for mass breaks anymore, that they, um, you know, you're just keeping insides and the risk gets higher. So there, there is reasons to bring everybody back, but there's also reasons to stay where we are. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but I do hope that whatever we decide to do, we do it in the safest and smartest way possible. Because right now, and so my kids are in like daycare settings, so I'm not really, I'm not in this world yet. I'm, I'm approaching it. But um, so right now, what I've heard and what I understand is that we are moving towards a reintegration of kids coming back to school. I know IPS 
which is my district, um, is going back to in-person. Um, I guess, I guess like, so we're talking about reintegration. No, districts are going to differ, but what is, I guess, let's talk about before coronavirus. What are some things that maybe to go back to whole, because ultimately, right, the goal is for everybody to be back, be back in school, but to do so safely, to do so consciously, um, which I'm so thrilled to hear you do feel safe and that your district has done that in a way that feels empowering and safe um, and conscious. But what what was before coronavirus and in our process to reintegrate whenever, however that is, what might be some things? Because when I think of reintegration, I think of returning home, it's kind of like Dorothy realizing like, oh, I could have gone home all along, except you can, because there's a large virus there. Yeah. Um, you have to solve for that, then you can. But, you know, when she returns home, she takes the things she learned. And it's, it's, it's not that she ever left, right? Like she was just kind of outside of herself, and then she does return home. But Dorothy returns a little bit better and a little bit different, right? So I'm wondering what you see are the opportunities from pre-COVID learning that you hope to take into reintegration, some of Asia, of school, whenever and however that plays out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can speak to that in two different areas. One, when it comes to actual teaching and pedagogy, um, I think that we have been thrust into this world of learning about technology. And I wouldn't say new technology because a lot of it's already existed. But I mean, as we know, teachers are some of the busiest professionals out there. Um, we, you know, teach all day. I'm talking in front of kids all day. So all the planning and the grading comes home with me. And as much as I would love to spend hours and hours researching awesome tech, like educational tools in, on the internet and in technology, I don't always have the time to do that. But we have been thrust into this world where we've had to. And um, for good or for bad, having, you know, going into quarantine the spring gave us a lot of time to research new things and to try things out. And those things won't go away. I mean, the new tools that we're doing, it's not like I'm going to find all these awesome tools like right now and then next year say, oh, never mind, I'm going to go back to what I was doing before. Uh, like, we'll definitely keep those things with us. And so I think that there's a lot of technology out there that really absolutely impacts student learning in an incredibly positive way. Um, it empowers students in ways that they weren't able to do before with pen and paper. Um, the like creativity and you know, yeah, I mean, just the creativity and um, lack of words here. I'm the English teacher, but <laughs> sometimes I, um, just, I mean, the things that they are able to do with techno technology that they can't just do with a pen and paper and colored pencils in class is incredible. And that stuff will not go away, these new tools that we've learned about or that have been invented in response to at-home learning. Um, from another aspect of this, I think just kids um, have learned so much. Definitely a sense of responsibility and maturity that I've seen this year that I haven't seen in years past. I mean, these kids today have had to go through I'll, they've had to think about much bigger and powerful things in the world that kids in years past have not had to. I mean, they are suddenly living in a world where their everyday actions could impact their loved ones. Um, and that's a big weight to carry around. They're having to, most of them parents work in their home all day alone and have to be responsible for their education. So there's definitely going to be, you know, a sense of responsibility in this year's or this generation of kids that I don't think we've, seen before. Um, but at the same time with that, I've seen a almost a return to a traditional childhood appreciation for human connection. So one thing that I've seen in the last few years is more and more kids just relying on technology for everything. That it's like, oh, I would rather just have the computer read this to me. Like, I would rather just do this on my own at home. Like every time we had a snow day for e-learning, it was like, finally, I could just do work at my house. But now these kids, like they don't want to do work at their house all the time. It's overload. They're tired of it. They're fatigued from it. And I don't blame them. We take our kids outside on a mask break um, every class. We have a 90 minute block. And so in the middle of our 90 minute block, we go outside for mask breaks, mask breaks weather permitting. 
um, which we've been very lucky with weather so far this year. Um, I don't know exactly what we're going to do when it gets colder, but um, for right now it's really nice. Um, and so they, we go outside and I don't let them bring their phones outside. And I have not had a single kid complain about not being able to have their phone outside, which I feel like in years past, that would have been like, oh, seriously, but I'd rather just play on my phone. <laughs> and I plan games for us to do. Like I think back to my like Girl Scout days and I'm like, you know, planning games for us to do. And they look, are we playing a game today? Are we playing a game today? And they're like, yes. And they get so excited or they just stand around and talk to me and we have conversations and they talk to each other face to face. And they, ha I, I truly believe they're learning to appreciate that, that technology is not everything. Um, and so when we talk about reintegration into a world post COVID and um, how kids, how kids are functioning in this world post COVID, I, I truly believe that there will be a positive reintegration. I mean, of human an appreciation for human connection that was, I think going away before this, this time is really, shown us that technology is not everything and now that we've had a lack of human connection i mean you miss what you like you know or you learn to appreciate when something's gone when you took it for granted before and i think that that's um going to stay also i love that i love hearing that they love going out and playing and uh you know it's weird like my kids i built them during the pandemic i built them a playhouse outdoors and i um, God, uh, we put so much, so much shit in our backyard just to like keep them entertained while we were all home all the time. And they take that for granted now, you know, cause like they had it all summer and it's like so stupid and old. And so it's just so interesting how we become acclimated to what is, and then we miss, or we have this nostalgia. So I, I hope there's a way, like you're saying to, to constantly appreciate that and, Sometimes I think scary and traumatic things can, and, and I mean traumatic and like the little T, big T is a whole different thing, but um, I think sometimes it can really enforce an appreciation that's long lasting. I know for me, Sandy Hooks has made um, a lifelong impression on how I say goodbye to my children every day. Um, and while I wish we could reverse that incident, I am grateful that it's given me insight into how precious and fragile everything is. And, and so I hope I, I don't like, you know, I hear the sentiment a lot, like, Oh, I don't ever want to go back to the way things were. And God, I miss hugging people and I'm an introvert and I miss, I thought I was an introvert. I'm not, I miss hugging people. I miss being with people. And I just hope, I hope we, we find a middle and I hope um, in that integration, we don't forget you know, in our lifetime, what it was like to not be with each other. So I love both those ideas. And so, so what implications, well, so when, you know, when we do reintegrate, which again, all of this is hypothetical, because who knows, what uh, scares you about that? Safety, um, first and foremost, and I guess really the only thing that I'm afraid of, because I, I mean, I'm an educator at heart. My heart will not be full until I have a classroom of happy and healthy kids in there. So of course I want my kids back. And also because of the issues that we deal with, with tequity and things like that, and kids, um, the achievement gap that I think will come from this time. Um, like there's definitely reasons to bring kids back, but it really just is safety. I mean, with 30 kids in a classroom, there's no chance of social distancing. As the weather gets colder, there's, you know, you can't take them outside for mass breaks. So they're in contained spaces for a lot longer periods of time. Um, and I, it, it truly, I mean, I, I don't want to get coronavirus. I mean, I don't know the long-term effects of this. Um, I don't want a kid to take something home to a grandparent or a parent that is, you know, I mean, I'll, in, you know, com and you know, compromised, excuse me. Um, and so, so that's what scares me really. That's it. Um, every other reason for bringing kids back. I think every educator feels the same way. We want our kids in our classroom. We don't want them to be struggling at home because they are. Um, and, but it's just the societal, um, like responsibility that we all have to just keep each other safe 
which has been so ingrained in us for the last six months of we're all making sacrifices, we're all doing everything we can to keep each other safe, which is so true. And so bringing all these kids back into the building, I wonder if that is going against some of these things that we've been told for the last six months. Mm. However, I mean, there's, I don't have an answer to this. I'm just, you know, stating problems on both sides that, but there's also like a lot of good reasons to bring kids back. So I just, I don't know. Well, you shared a little bit about it, but what, what brings you joy about the prospect of reintegrating aside uh, from what you shared, which is like having a class full of students again, what are some things that bring you joy when you think about that? Um, one thing that's been good during the hybrid schedule and that I think will continue to be a positive from here on out is the human connection that I have been able to make and just the teacher-student connection with having a smaller class of kids. So for the first three months of school, I only had half of my kids at one time. And so I was able to make truly much more meaningful connections with each of these students with only 10 at a time, you can actually have real conversations. You're not dealing with a classroom full of kids with we're taking these breaks together where we just talk. And so bringing everybody back together, I think will be a entirely different and really cool classroom experience to know that I have, I've been able to build for the first couple months of school, really meaningful relationships with every single one of these students. When, when you have 30 kids at one time and you're, maybe you develop that with some kids, but inevitably some, you're not gonna develop those connections with. And not saying they get lost, but I mean, different kids will gravitate towards different teachers. Whereas now I've been able to actually form those connections with every single one of my students in one way or another. And so the classroom environment, um, I'm excited to see what can be done and what can be learned in a classroom setting where you have that positive relationship with each of those kids. Um, and just to bring them all back and to see what they do this year and how they grow and how they learn. And um, I, I know that I've learned the value of those meaningful relationships. I think that a lot of teachers fall into that day to day, like, okay, come into class, let's start working, do the bell work on the board, teach, teach, teach. And you don't really stop and get to know every single kid. And I think that that's something that I know I will take away from this year is the value of that and I'm excited to, to bring all the kids back and to see how that um, how that plays out in the rest of the school year and hopefully make that change in years to come that even though I'm gonna you know hopefully one day eventually have 30 kids back in my classroom just taking the time out of every single day to check in with kids um, and get to know them a little bit better and know how their day is going talk to them about their weekend and not skipping over that because we have to get to the bell work on time you know Mm. Kids are lucky to have you, Katie. <laughs> um, last question, then, if you have anything else you want to share about reintegration or like a statement to the parents or <laughs> anything, uh, that is, the floor is yours. But you mentioned a little bit about the um, achievement gap. What implications, both positive and negative, do you see or do you foresee, foresee in the, the years to come from this from this time and who knows how long this time is. Yeah, I know that, so back when everything shut down in March, um, one of the biggest things that I heard from my district and from others was just practice grace. You know, it's okay if kids don't turn things in, like we're just trying to provide some stability and not saying that academics went out the window, but it was a lot of maintenance type work. It wasn't really learning new things and that's what needed to be done at that time and that's fine. And so I think that this year there's been a much more intentional, um, or teachers have been much more intentional about not being so, not providing just maintenance type work, but to, you know, we're learning new things, being more rigorous, but with the three days at home, or even I know that it, our, my district's plan of when we go fully back, um, from hybrid bring all the kids back we're still planning on doing virtual days on wednesdays so the kids are still only in school for four days a week um and even then you're getting kids at home that don't have internet that don't have or good internet that's spotty they don't have stay-at-home moms to walk them through every single thing and that's just reality mm -hmm. um and so they're e even 
even with teachers for the couple days a week we see kids, if we're being more intentional about providing more rigorous work, there's still this, nothing's ever perfect. It's, it's still not the same as five days in school. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I think long-term there could be an academic gap. Um, however, I think that it offsets a bit with the responsibility that kids are learning by being at home like this. I mean, when they have to get up every single day, check into their classes, do their homework on their own, I think that on the other side, we will see an increase or a, a growth in kids that are more responsible and more self-sufficient self, self than kids that we've seen in the past few years. Um, and I don't know if, you know, I'm a teacher, but I don't know if I believe that academics is everything. Um, I think that the stability that we're providing for kids just with that human connection and just being there for them is so much more important. And so, you know, academics, it, there might be a gap, but if it, there is, I don't know if it's the end of the world, especially at the middle school level. Um, and I think that the world will adapt to meet those needs. I would imagine that kids, by the time they get to college, like they'll, I mean, I think that these kids will be labeled the COVID generation for forever to come. Mm -hmm. Um, and they'll catch up in other ways. Kids are smart and they're, they adapt and they grow so fast as like, I mean, your mom, you know how fast they grow and they learn. And I think that when it comes down to it, they're going to be just fine. And maybe I know every child is different, but maybe they're going to be a bit more compassionate because they've had to see their classmates and their parents. They've had to see people suffer and you know, compassion means to suffer with. And they have certainly, whether they've liked it or not, had to suffer with these things instead of being shielded from them. Um, you know, and uh, my kids are still a little young to understand everything, but we've tried to be as honest as possible. And um, the week that we're recording this, it, it, we're coming up on Yom Kippur and I'm Jewish and the, uh, this is the holiday of atonement. And so Magnolia is four and she just said to me the other day, I, I look forward to us, you know, having the time to say our sorries for the things that we did wrong. And I was like, oh, and then, <laughs> and then, so I was like, oh, she gets it. And then she goes, yeah, because you, you have a lot to apologize to me for. <laughs> Damn. All those times you made her go to bed. You know, she didn't want to do eat broccoli I was yeah. like so I was like oh my god like she gets it she's so young and then she's like yeah because you bitch <laughs> oh my gosh you know I mean? but hopefully um hopefully this is a generation that is not um ignorant to suffering you know and I think we do try to shield our children I think there's a lot that is necessary about that and then I think to your point, kids are really smart and perceptive and um, smarter than I think a lot of people give them credit. And they've had to feel all this. So I think the intel intelligence is, there are many forms of intelligence. So perhaps there'll be a more um, emotionally intelligent generation. Yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking the same as emotionally intelligent, like as you were speaking, because I, I think that, and if I could, you know, add to that, that when we, when I see achievement gap, I guess I want to make it an addendum to what I said before, that achievement gap is very relative. Um, and our society's standards for student achievement has continuously become more and more rigorous as time has gone on. I mean, I remember state testing when I was in school was like a joke. It was like, oh yeah, like as long as you show up every day, you pretty much learn something and you could totally pass state testing. And it was like the easy days of the year. And now state testing is like the most like feared thing for so many of these kids. It's hard for them. And they're learning stuff now in junior high that like we, we were just planning, uh, we actually had to meet Saturday morning to plan for our next unit this last weekend, my department, and we're teaching juxtaposition, which I don't know if any of you listening even know what that is, um, but I learned that in 11th grade AP English. We are, it's on our lessons for seventh grade regular English. Wow. And I'm sitting there, and like one of my fellow co-workers had to, she's like, I honestly don't 
even think I know what this is. Like, I mean, the rigor that we've set for these kids and the standard of achievement has become so high that when I, I talk about achievement gap, I mean, okay, maybe they won't be as prepared for what the state test would have been as of a year ago, but is that really achievement? Like, what are we really measuring here? And like you said, things with emotional intelligence and compassion and responsibility and maturity, these are things that honestly in life probably matter much more than knowing what juxtaposition is in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and here I am, the English teacher saying this, I know I probably sound, um, or a lot, I don't know. No, uh, I think, yeah. I think the time, this but time it's, it's, the world, it's true. It's being realistic. That is that really the achievement that we want our kids to achieve? Or like, I think that this time, if anything has shown us that we need to stop and reevaluate where we are as a society and what are we really asking of people and what's really important when it comes down to it, when we're in a time of crisis, what was really important? The emotional intelligence to be compassionate towards your family members or the fact that you can divide fractions at age 10? I mean, probably the former. <laughs> so I think that achievement gap is relative. Yeah, I love that. And I love that because I think this year has made us all wake up to one size does not fit all. Like to reintegrate in my in my thought, it's to truly embrace what we claim is a melting pot is to is to accept that that melting pot is more like chili than it is like a butternut squash puree that's like one, <laughs> you know, one ingredient like the uh, you know Black Lives Matters movement, and I've been waking up a ton to the the rights that you know folks with disabilities are fighting for still that are so basic and you know basic human rights for Black and Brown people, basic human rights for those with disabilities, and waking up to giving human rights and learning emotional intelligence doesn't mean one size fits all. It doesn't mean that we all then have to look and do and act exactly the same way. It means expanding, expanding the whole to fit everybody in unique ways. And to your point, like maybe some students, we come to the awakening that some students achieve not because they're A students, but because they're the emotional support students. And, you know, I, I hope we learn from this year. I think it was a gift and we can hopefully use that gift for better. And it, I mean, it sounds like you are. Um, so I just, I, if there's anything else you want to say about teaching or, um, you know, when we start to look at reintegrating or parents start to look at sending their kids back, is there anything you want to share or say? Yeah. One thing that I've been saying to a lot of people this whole time is that, you know, I know we just talked about achievement gap and stuff, but I think that there's still parents out there that are worried that their children or their child is not going to be receiving the same quality of education. And I guess my message would just be that to trust the teachers, like throughout kids life, I mean, their academics will be caught up, your kid will be just fine. You know, if they don't learn about juxtaposition in seventh grade, but they end up learning it in 10th grade, they're still going to be okay in life or even just, you know, in math, social studies, science, whatever it is, those skills can be caught up. Kids are sponges. I mean, they will absorb stuff. However, it's the emotional, the physical, the mental well-being that can't. The damage that's done at this time, and, and like you mentioned earlier, middle school is the most formative time in a kid's life, and that's why so many middle school teachers love that time. Um, but yeah, it's the academics can be caught up. The well-being of our kids will have detrimental effects if we're not um, taking care of them at this time. So even if academics is not the most rigorous or the thing that's at the forefront of every person's conversation, it's the stability that school provides. It is the care and human connection that they're getting from their peers and their teachers and the social skills that they get from being in school as opposed to being at home. I mean, that's the stuff, the games that we're playing outside, you know, just the being a kid, the fun side of it. That's what's the most important thing right now. And, and that's that. And that's it. Ugh, you are such a gift. You are such a gift. I'm so grateful. 
you are a gift, Shannon, and thank you for having me. Thank you for all of your years of teaching and guidance, and thank you for listening to me talk. I can talk and talk and talk all day, so <laughs> thank I mean, you for having me on. No, I'm so appreciative, and um, I is there any information about you that like you want people to know or share just like say hello to you at the studio or do you do you want to share your instagram i know that's kind of a like middle weird ground for teachers so i oh, no it's fun i could feel like a youtube blogger blogger like like and subscribe <laughs> like, yeah. at katie Sonson. yeah so my instagram is just at katie Sonson, k-a-t-y-s-o-n-k-s-e-n um, I love to talk about really anything with anybody because I could talk all day. So feel free to say hi. Um, big In astrology. Fan. You're a big fan. fan. I know. I was at the, the last new moon flow and was there for like 30 minutes after class, just like <laughs> nerding out about astrology. I thought it was nine o'clock and my boyfriend's waiting for dinner and I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like, I was just talking about <laughs> the moon. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So any of that swimming uh, sports, coaching, teaching, astrology, all of it, healthy eating, uh, your your, muscles, things that I nerd out about. So, You're an yeah. angel in the world. Thank you for uh, lending your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me.